Hello, I'm Jennifer Leah, founder of Sound Foundations Homeschool, where I help every mom get the tools and support she needs to easily build a thriving and successful homeschool for any child with my books and exclusive homeschool mom group on Facebook at soundfoundationshomeschool.com. I'm so glad to be here today and to chat with you about the beauty of every child and the special gifts that he or she has. Um, I think that often in our culture today, we, we look at the weaknesses and we look at um, keeping up and not, not what isn't working, um, what our child can't do, what, um, where we aren't winning because everything is about winning and being on top and being first. And while it's important to look at our strengths and to use them, it's not the only thing um, that should define us by that our weaknesses against other strengths. Because right now, uh, most of the strengths that we're looking at are gifts that certain children have, but not gifts that every child has. And every child is a gift and has gifts. If we look at our faith and we look at, at the Bible, we can see that most of the people who were the, um, the biggest movers and shakers, who made the biggest impact in history, in our faith, and in the Bible, were not the quote-unquote winners or the, the top people. They were not the people who had it all together, the people who had um, every advantage they all had something that they had to overcome. And as children of God, we are all endowed with special gifts. We all have this mission that we've been sent here to do. Our missions all look different. Not every one of us is born to be an engineer. And I always say, um, you know, right now there's a huge push for everyone to be in engineering, to be in science and math, to be the top, you know, math and science student. And if you're not, well then, people start to worry about you. And it's not realistic to expect everybody to do that, but that's kind of where the push is right now. But imagine what our world would be like if everyone were an electrical engineer. I mean, what would they have to work on? They, they wouldn't have buildings to fix, you know, to put their electrical into. There would be no art, there would be no music, there would be no one to care for them when they got sick. There's so many things that would be missing if we all just reached this epitome of achievement. So that is why God in his great wisdom and mercy has made us all different because the world would be such a boring place if we were all exactly the same. When we look at teaching our children at home, we need to always come from a place of that they are made in the image and likeness of Christ. Christ had, was perfect in his being, but he was also took human form and that human form had weaknesses. So when we look at them as, first of all, a gift from God and also an image and likeness of Christ, it puts into perspective anything that maybe um, they are struggling with and holding back. And I keep saying that anyone, especially a child, is worth so much more than the sum of their weaknesses. When we are educating, we tend to worry about what isn't working instead of seeing what is. And so over the years in teaching my own children who have had um, learning issues, disabilities, and struggles, I realized that in the modern way of educating where we focus on what's wrong and really focus on it and, and define children with IEPs or with customized learning plans or with special classes by what is wrong with them instead of looking at what is right because really God doesn't make mistakes. So what's wrong isn't really wrong. It is part of who they are, it is part of their gift, and it's part of what they have to give to the world. So I have developed a five-step program for working through um, with children who are struggling with anything. And really, all of us have gifts and weaknesses. Um, I've said this to my children many times, that we all have something we need to work on. Just like we're all sinners, none of us are perfect. <laughs> we all have something that we need to work on. So um, when we start to define children as ones that have special needs and ones that don't, we're missing the point. They all have some sort of special need. Some are much more obvious than others. And some special needs require a lot more attention and support. But that doesn't mean that the other children 
um, have it all together and aren't doing anything wrong. They just have different gifts. Again, everyone has different gifts. So this program focuses on the gifts, the dignity, and the passions of a child instead of just where they don't fit in, you know, where they're a square peg in, in a round hole. Because all of us are square pegs and round holes somewhere, right? I could never be a professional football player. That doesn't mean that I'm any less worthy than anybody else to be educated or um, to enjoy my life. So this is my five-step program. As I said, I've used it with my own children. I've um, taught it to other moms to use with theirs. And it is something that can be used for whatever it is the struggle is at any age, at any level, at any ability. So here are the five steps. Now the first step is something that I have to say when I did it, I really was resistant to it because even though I knew it was what we had to do, I was really worried because what do homeschool moms worry about? We worry about keeping up, falling behind, <laughs> you know, not getting to the end of where we need to be. What if public school passes us up and you know everybody realizes that we're not succeeding at homeschooling. But the first step really is to decompress because when there is a struggle going on, whatever the struggle is, whether it's physical, it's mental, it's intellectual, spiritual, there's a lot of stress. Okay. And so as the stress builds, even things that could be easy or easier for that child now becomes difficult. Everything grinds to a halt because there's so much effort being put into um, the area where that child is not succeeding that they just can't cope with everything else. And so you are frustrated, the child is frustrated, and there's just no getting past it because you've reached this pinnacle of, you know, it's ready to explode. And what you don't want to have is it explode because then you're going to have more work to do. So this decompression really is a step back. And in our culture, we're taught to just keep going, you know, work harder, work harder, work harder. If it's not working for five days a week, then maybe you should school for six days a week. If you can't learn your multiplication facts in five hours a day, maybe you should spend 10 hours a day and get a tutor. That's not what should be happening now. When you've reached that point where you just don't know where to go, and perhaps you're dealing with a new need that you've just realized that your child has a learning need and you're not sure what to do with it, or you've just um, gotten a child that has a special need to the point that they're going to be schooled and you've started doing it, but it's just not working. So whatever it is, it's just not working and everyone is frustrated. The first thing you need to do is decompress. Take a step back, take some time off. Now, that's easier said than done because I know like me when I thought take time off how can we take time off I mean we're already not doing what we're supposed to be doing right we're already falling behind <laughs> if we take off a week or two weeks or a month how are we ever going to catch up but like I said nothing is getting done because you are struggling so very much right then so taking some time to lie low this is when there's not school going on there is not checklists being checked. There are not tests being given, even if they are ones that you say, oh, well, my child is a, a spelling ace, even though they can't do anything else. No, there's no spelling. There's nothing. You really take some time to just let the desk settle, for everyone to catch their breath, and to take a step back so you can get there, start making progress with fresh, um, like, resolve and a fresh vision. During this decompression, which really should last um, at least a couple weeks, but could last a few months, there can still be learning going on, but it should not be structured learning. So audiobooks, educational videos, um, field trips, just things that are enjoyable is what you should be doing so that you're not just letting, you know, letting it go and and letting them zone out on, um, you know, Dora and um, I don't even know. I'm trying to think. Uh, what do my kids like to watch? Oh, Daniel Tiger. <laughs> yeah, Daniel Tiger. Um, anyway, you're not just letting them zone out on that or play video games for seven hours a day. Although, if 
video games is how they burn off steam, maybe you let them do that a little bit more during this time. <laughs> but you still want to be learning, but what you want to do is find learning that's enjoyable so that once again they can fall in love with learning. Because until this point, maybe at one point they loved learning, but now they've gotten to the point there's nothing to love about school. All it is is struggle and hard, and they don't love it. <laughs> so you need to show them that ed school is not education, okay? Getting an education and learning can be fun, and we're going to make it fun. And if it takes six months for you to get through this whole process, then you know what? Those are six months well spent because when you get to the end, to step five, and you start again, you will start in such a better place and you will work much more efficiently and everyone will, will be on more sure footing. So in your decompression, just put everything away and stop because you are going to need to decompress too, okay? And find some fun things, but maybe just do nothing for like three days and let your child get bored because boredom truly is the mother of invention. It's not just necessity. When kids get bored, they learn a lot about themselves. And in a culture that really shuns boredom and downtime and um, you know having nothing to do, that's, a, that's really a disability to our children more than any of these other things that, that they're telling us are disabilities. It's a disadvantage that our kids don't have that chance to do that. So provide that for your children, the chance to get bored, the chance of self-discovery and um, the chance to just really invent their own learning. Once you've come to the end of this decompression phase, because at some point you're going to need a little bit more structure, but you've seen that things have settled down, maybe you've begun to see your child in a new light, you have um, a renewed will to make this work, um, you've had a chance to rest and recuperate. The second step is to assess strengths. Now, as I said, we always start with the weakness, right? We start with, oh, well, if that child's dyslexic, this is what they need. <laughs> that child has um, problems with grasping the finger. Well, this is the grasping a pencil. This is the special contraption that they need to use that. I'm not saying that all any of that is wrong, but in this time, we're going to start from what their strengths are. What is your child's special gift? What have they been given? by God that makes them this beautiful, unique, wonderful soul. What is their mission here? Now, I'm not saying that you're gonna discover their entire life mission during this decompression phase, but take a step back and really look, what is your child gifted in? Everybody's gifts can look different. A child might be gifted in astrophysics, even if they have physical limitations, okay? A child may be gifted in making friends. A child may be gifted in building Lego creations. Um, a child may be gifted in making tea and serving it. Whatever that child's gift is, is a wonderful gift, and it's something that needs to be celebrated. So in assessing the strengths, we need to look at First, what their special gift is. What is it that um, really lights them up? So in, in a gift, it should be their passion and also what is easily accessible to them. Because sometimes there's things that we can do quickly, easily, but we just don't enjoy them, right? Um, so in assessing your strengths, you need to assess both of that. First of all, what can they physically, mentally, and intellectually do well um, because of their own gifts that have been given to them? by our creator? <laughs> and second, what are their passions that are deep down in their heart that God is calling them to get involved with or to study or to fall in love with? In assessing these, you need to let follow your child instead of pulling them along or guiding them, okay? They need to be in the driver's seat. Now, you can steer them a little bit, but you need to let them experiment. And it, there may be a time where they think that this is their strength, but it just doesn't work out. Let them try it out and see, and don't just dismiss it. Assessing strengths can begin during the decompression phase, because if there's something that your child really loves, such as, let's say, construction vehicles, that can be their little independent study that they work on um, while you're decompressing. But assessing the strengths really means to find that gift and then begin um, working a little bit with that gift, fostering that gift, 
encouraging that gift, cheering that gift on, and showing that child what makes them so very special and loved and wonderful and how they are an asset to this world. Because all of us are those little strands. Have you ever heard about the tapestry? <laughs> all of us are those little strands in the tapestry. And you know what? You can't really tell one from the other. And that little red line that doesn't look like it's doing much, if you take it out, is going to completely ruin the entire picture. So your child might be that little red line that you don't notice much until it was taken out. And you have to show them how important that red line is, even though it doesn't stand out, even though the cobalt blue is the one that everybody comments on, that red line is important and you need them to know that. After you've had a chance to assess those strengths and um, find their passions and their love, the next thing to do is evaluate physical limitations. Now, sometimes struggles come from physical limitations, or they come from mental limitations or emotional limitations. There are different ways that can do that. But it's important before we start addressing where it's coming from, that we're sure that their physical needs are met. Now, physical needs could be from a physical disability or a physical challenge, okay? If, if your child can't physically hold a pencil, then that is something that you're going to need to learn how to create an adaptation for, how to work around that so that they aren't frustrated by it. But this is a tool that we have. And isn't it great that God let us find this tool that will let you do what you want to do? Okay, so it should never be seen as something that, well, because you can't do it or you're not good enough, this is why you have. No, it's a gift that we have this. Aren't we blessed that, you know, we all struggle and this is your struggle and I'm going to help you get this tool to make it go quicker or more easily or to just um, help you along. But physical limitations can also be that perhaps they just can't sit for four hours straight. Um, there's some children that just need breaks more often. Perhaps they need a different diet. Um, maybe what they're eating for breakfast just isn't enough to keep them going. Maybe they need like a really high protein breakfast or they're just not going to be able to function. I mean, everybody is different. I'm not going to tell you what kind of diet you need to have your child on. But I know that from my own children, we've found over the years what works and what doesn't. And there's some things that I thought were wonderful for them to eat, but it didn't help them in being able to physically perform their tasks. So do they need a warmer environment? Do they need a cooler environment? Do they need a different workspace? I mean, there are many physical aspects to schooling and just existing in a home uh, that can be addressed. And it's something to take really time to think about because just because everyone starts school at, let's say, 830 doesn't mean that's what works best for your child. Maybe your child really needs to sleep until 10 and start school at 1130 after they've had a chance to have a good breakfast and exercise or something. And that will help them to get where they need to be. And that will bolster their strength, not work against it. So I really encourage you to be creative with this. Um, don't just start at the very surface area of, um, well, my child looks fine, or, oh, I know that um, they have this problem. It really can go much deeper. Like I said, diet, um, temperature of the room, um, workspace, um, sitting environment, how long they're working, what they're getting to do in between subjects. So it's something that you really need to experiment with and try and see what, um, what works best for your child and how he will thrive. And like I said, don't worry about what everybody else is doing. It doesn't have to look like everybody else. If your child does best when they have chicken and beef for breakfast, then have chicken and beef for breakfast and have eggs and pancakes for dinner. It doesn't matter because we're all unique. And honestly, what difference does it make? Um, so now that you've decompressed, you've bolstered those strengths, you've addressed any kind of physical limitations or physical needs that are not being met, the fourth step is to look, is to find the weakness. Now, for some children, you may have known at the beginning what the weakness is. For others, you just know that it's just not working and you need to discover exactly what isn't working. 
this is the time to schedule appointments with specialists to possibly consult a learning consultant um, to have them tested for learning disabilities to get any answers to the questions of what isn't working because after you've done the strengths and you've done the physical needs and there's still something not working you as a parent know when your child has a problem very often before the medical community can tell you that it does so um, you need to follow that instinct and find out exactly what the problem is that doesn't mean that that problem is ever going to define your child because your child is a child of god your child is not a child of dyslexia your child is not a child of cerebral palsy your child is not a child of um, missing an arm. Your child is a child of God, no matter what their physical, mental, emotional makeups are. But finding that weakness and learning the strategies that you need that, as I said, may take a specialist to teach you what to do or a specialist to come in and work alongside you to give them the physical therapy, the occupational therapy, the speech therapy, whatever it is, is now where you are going to begin to build that child up to find what they need to get them from point A to point B. Now their point A and point B could be very different than what your neighbor's point A and point B is. I mean, after all, God numbered our days, right? He created our days, he designed our days, he built our life, he has a plan for our life. And we are given free will, which is a wonderful blessing, but we all have something that we need to accomplish. And so getting your child to be able to do what he or she wants and what he or she needs is really the focus of finding this weakness. It, it has no other bearing, okay? Because if your child needs a special tool or needs a special curriculum or needs a special therapy, this is the time to bring it in. You should never deny your child that. It's just that that should never be um, the first thing that defines them or your first plan of attack in education. It should always be that they are wonderful in X, Y, and Z. Um, in finding this weakness, you may have to have another decompression time because you, you're going to need to get up to speed and know how to now address what you have found. If you already knew what the problem was or had a strong suspicion of it, this is the time to bring in the resources that you need to do the research that you need, to hire someone to help you to take extra classes, whatever it is that you need to be able to provide the education that your child needs. Um, it doesn't mean that you can't educate them. It doesn't mean that you can't be in charge of their education because really, let's be honest, homeschooling doesn't mean that you are the only teacher of your child. What it means is that you are taking charge of their education. You are like the CEO of their education and you are going to make sure that they get what they need and it's, it's, you know, the buck stops here and I'm, I'm going to take care of it. Now, the reason why um, a parent is the best one to do this, finding the weakness step, is because a parent isn't going to just stop at finding the weakness or isn't going to say, well, this is what's wrong with them. So here's their bar. And once they reach that bar, well, that's good enough. Because you as a parent love your child. You know your child better than anyone will ever know that child. And you have more of a vested interest than anyone in the world other than God in that child's well-being, in their success in life, and in um, them fulfilling their vocation in this world. So when your child reaches this bar and you realize, you know what, he really wants to go past that bar, or he really can go past that bar, or we're going to find a way to make his bar just a little bit different, um, maybe it doesn't have to be a bar you know what, maybe it can be a pool. <laughs> maybe he doesn't have to jump over the hurdle. Maybe he can float in the pool, okay? This is what I'm saying. So um, don't be afraid to take charge of that and have your child education look completely different than anybody else's because your child is completely different than anybody else and homeschooling should not look like being in school. It's not school at home. It is a home education and you are the one that is in charge. So that's why you finding this weakness and developing a plan really is a godsend. That, that's what God puts you on this earth to do. That's why he gave you this child, because he knows that you can do this for this child and that he is going to equip you with the grace to find what this child needs. Um, 
and to celebrate everything that's wonderful about them. Now, the last step is to start again. And I wish I could give you a timeline and tell you when that is. I mean, it could be that you start decompression on Monday and by the next Monday, you're ready to start again. Although I don't advise at all doing it that quickly. But there are other children that might have to start decompression um, at Christmas and they aren't ready to start again until September. Or they might need a whole year of unschooling or de-schooling before they're ready to start that again. It doesn't mean that they are falling behind. It doesn't mean that um, they're not learning because they are. We need to really celebrate the learning that they are getting. And really they're learning about themselves and they're learning about their vocation. And that's a wonderful process of learning to have. Now in starting again, it could be that you've thrown out everything that you had. And that's okay. Throwing everything out, it may be painful, but I promise you, you'll never regret it. When you start again, both of you will be fresh. You'll have a plan in place. You will know what you are doing and you will have created a school situation using professionals or using yourself, using outsourced classes or using new books. Whatever it is that you pick, you're going to be starting again with a curriculum that is designed specially for your child to meet their needs and to celebrate their gifts. Now, in the public school, because I was a public school teacher for five years, and I know that children with special needs are often given IEPs or individually, individualized education plans. These plans are worked on by the child study team for a long time and teachers sign up off on it and parents come and meet and sign off on it. And it, it details exactly what a teacher in school is supposed to do and provide for any given child. Um, and they are individualized to an extent, but they're still kind of boxes that they check. Do you know what I'm saying? If you want your child to have the ultimate individualized education program, then you need to take charge of their education. And no education is more individualized than homeschooling, even in the most restrictive districts, countries, and states. You still are providing a much more personalized experience um, than any school could ever do. Because as I said, you are going to take that ball and keep running for as long as you can. You are going to reevaluate, even if it's not the end of the quarter, the end of the year, time for IEP to be um, reassessed or um, for IEP meetings in the spring or time for standardized testing. It doesn't matter. You don't have a deadline. You don't have a schedule of when you are going to decide to make a change and help your child or to order what they need. Um, so in starting again, don't feel like you have failed or don't look at, oh, we lost all this time. You didn't lose anything. What you gained was amazing perspective. You gained um, the confidence and the strength of your child and you gained a chance to bond with your child and to steer them where God wants them to be. I mean, just think of that, because I often say we are called to get our children to heaven, not Harvard, right? Um, when we focus on education a lot, often we just worry about what they're going to get at the end instead of where they're going to go. And where do we want our children to go? We really want them to go to heaven. I mean, that is, that's the ultimate goal. <laughs> it doesn't matter if they get to heaven as a plumber or an astrophysicist, right? They're all saints. We want our children to be saints. We don't, we don't show up with your degree or your diploma or your report card or any of that stuff or your IEP. You show up with your soul and um, your good works that you've got done. And so that should always be our main focus in doing this. And we should never lose sight of the gift that God gave us, just like the title of this summit, Accepting the Gift. We have been given a gift, and our gift might be wrapped in a package that we never expected. It might be wrapped in a package that we've never seen before, or that we're really not sure what to do with. But it's a gift. Every person's life is a gift. And if I've learned anything in my life, and in working with children with special needs, and in teaching my own children, and just trying to follow what God wants me to do, it's that those packages that 
aren't wrapped the way we would expect them to be are the best packages of all because they were wrapped in a way that is complex and beautiful and contributes to the story of the world in a way that we never imagined. Anybody can be a cookie cutter. We want our kids to be something special, right? So special needs children, just think of that. Your child is special. They are wonderful. They are special gifts that were given to you. And gifts aren't always easy. <laughs> I mean, in the Catholic tradition, a gift isn't that you have this wonderful thing and you open it up and it's like a fairy wand and now your house is perfect and your life is perfect and nobody ever gets sick. You know what? That's heaven. That's not being Catholic. That's not being Christian. That's not accepting God's graces. God's graces often come in affliction. They come in struggle. They come in strife. And so when we look at the saints and the martyrs and our beautiful history um, from our Judeo-Christian roots, it's not the people that had perfect lives. I mean, Jesus was born in a manger to an, a young girl who was unwed and laid in straw with animals around him in a tiny, tiny, like forgotten village in the cold. Like there's nothing romantic about that story other than that God loved us enough to do that, to suffer, to come down and really use his gifts in his weakness and that's what we are each called to do and that's what we're each called to do for our children is to find a way to use their gifts in their weakness because as i said we all have weaknesses and it's those that struggle that really appreciate weaknesses a lot more than the rest of us <laughs> if you have had things easy it's much harder for you to rely on God. It's much harder for you to grow in holiness and glory. So while we always want the best for our children and we want to shelter them and we, we don't want them to hurt, no parent ever wants their child to hurt and struggle and suffer and um, be in pain physically or um, emotionally. That's what makes them grow. And those children that have the greatest thorns are the ones that are going to bring about the greatest fruit for God. So in starting again, realize that you have done a wonderful thing for your child. Even if it took a year, even if now you feel like, oh, my child should be in fourth grade, but we're only doing first grade math. You know what? Your child's going to do well at fourth, first grade math. And God bless them for doing it because really it isn't about grades. Until public education was created, there's no such thing as grades. Is your child learning? Is your child growing? Are they working to the best of their ability? Are they, you know, loving life? Are they bolstering their gifts and their passions and their vocation for life? Then you are succeeding, my friend. And I want to keep encouraging you to keep doing that, to keep serving your child in the best way that you can and to seek the resources that you need to continue to do it without burning out because when you burn out, that, that doesn't help anybody. You need support, you need tools. And so that is part of these steps too. When you're going through it, look at it on a two-sided scale. Um, the first is for your child and the second is for you. What does your child need? What do you need? What are your strengths? What are you really good at helping this child with? What do you need some help with doing? Because I know that there were definitely things that I had to learn. <laughs> And most of it had to do with things that I thought were, you know, everybody should be able to do or, or I, like I did really well and couldn't understand why my child couldn't. So there were definitely things that I had to learn. There were weaknesses that I had to overcome and there were passions that I had to find um, in our own journey. I thank you for being with me today. And I really hope that this talk inspired you to accept the gift of your child as they are as a beautiful, wonderful, blessed child of God, and to take the time to go through these steps so that they can have a wonderful individualized education that leads them to heaven. Thank you and God bless.